Good morning, and uh, happy Sabbath to everyone. Um, I stand here with my brain going blank. I've been kind of watching Sean Boonstra, you know, and on YouTube you can get a lot of his sermons and and things, and they're really quite interesting. But when he preaches, he takes his shoes off, and he's always walking with stocking feet. And that made me think, you know, when we get to heaven, there won't be any reason to have to wear shoes because there won't be any broken glass to step on or any nails to step on, or the sand won't have any rocks or anything like that. And and uh, so we'll have no real need for shoes, and that's a good thing. I only wear shoes because I have to. And when I, yeah, Kathy, when I'm home, I don't wear shoes, and I'm really supposed to because I'm diabetic, but that's the chance I take. I can't stand to have shoes on my feet 24 hours a day. They just don't work. Our scripture this morning is in Psalm 133. If I can find it here. You know, this is really a nice Bible I have here. It was, um, it belonged to Charlotte Erdley. And apparently when, um, um, Helga and what's his name moved to Hawaii evidently they just turned it in because I found it in a box that was underneath the secretary's um, over here and um, it's a very nice Bible it was published in Germany because you know they were from Germany and she's put all these tabs on it so it's easy to find everything and I really like it because it's got words big enough to read. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious, precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descends upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings, even life forevermore forevermore. Our Father in heaven, this day we come to you because it is the day that you tell us to remember to the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For you are with us always on this day in the center of our thoughts and the center of our minds. Lord, give us wisdom and so that we may talk of you in ways of understanding so that we might be ready for that day when you come. We've been holding fast for a lot of years and yet it isn't quite time yet. The day will come quickly and then you will be here and we are so grateful that you have made that promise and we thank you in Jesus name. I was going to this morning, I had a uh, thought all picked out in my mind. I was going to talk about um, John Wiedner. Now he was a, um, he helped a lot of the Jews during World War II. A lot of Jews and a lot of airmen he saved from the Nazis. And so I was going to talk about him this morning, but uh, I was looking in the library for the book that I had read about him and I couldn't find it. And I searched and searched and couldn't find it. So. I thought, well, maybe I could get by without it. But then I was watching John Bradshaw the other evening, and he told, told about um, John Wiedner. He told the story of, of him and his, his um, helping so many people. So I had to choose another subject. So I have went to intercessory prayer now, intercessory prayer is a very vital part of the Christian life. 
and without it, we're missing an important part of our duty to our fellow man. Now, um, God created us to be joined together in, in um, groups and in one, one body so that we could be of one mind. And even if we have differences of opinion, we still have, we're still able to join together into a group and be of kind of one mind so that we we don't have a lot of um, bickering and stuff going on and so that's the way God wants us to be to be of uh, basically one mind and the ability to intercede for others is a God-given privilege he will only act on the earnest prayers of the faithful we as humans are inclined to ask God for what we want and for the things that are our heart's desires and anything that is wrong with us, but we don't tend to be um, so much wanting to talk about other people. But if we put other people in front of us and consider God's family first, then our prayers are more meaningful to him. And interceding you can intercede for family members, your own children, and, and all of us have children, I think, that are not within the church. Some of us are very fortunate that our children are, but uh, a lot of us don't have our whole families in the church. Jim and I, we're the only ones out of our two families, and our two families constitute quite a few people. So. Um, you know, we pray for them all the time, and you can pray for brothers and sisters. We have brothers and sisters that don't come to church, but we pray for them. And uh, even just friends, if you have friends, your neighbors, uh, we have a neighbor that's had open heart surgery twice, and uh, so we pray for her a lot. And there is always always someone that we can pray for and give give God the chance to work in their lives. The only way he can work in their lives when they're not within the church and their minds are not set on him is if other people pray for them because, <coughs> excuse me, it is, it, it, he doesn't intercede in other people's lives without permission. And so he, you know, that choice, always that you, you make your own choice. But now, when you intercede for other people, you must like them, I guess is the term. You can't intercede for somebody that you don't like because you have nothing in common with that person. So you come to the point where you have to get to know that person and, and get acquainted with them so that you can find out there are things about them that you like and so that you can pray for them. And uh, we need to, this intercession, because we need to grow in Christ and without it, we kind of stagnate. And so we need to st stand, <laughs> excuse me, we need to spend more time in prayer and give over to God what he expects from us. And now um, Kathy has got our mission story today. Now I want to thank the Gloria for the piano and our, our musicians for the beautiful job they do. I love the music. Good morning. This mission story is entitled, A Dream Comes True, and it's about a young lady named Samantha. Ever since she was young, Samantha loved listening to exciting stories about the Lazaro mission boat. Fascinated, she imagined what it might be like to work as a missionary along the Amazon, just like Leo and Jesse Hallowell. Little did she know that one day her dream would come true. After graduating from high school, Samantha studied nursing at the State University of West Paranha, a southern, in southern Brazil. When she finished with her training, Samantha had many job possibilities, but her heart was in missions. 
So she was delighted when she received an invitation to be a volunteer missionary in the Amazon region. She prayed, Jesus, if you want me to go, please open all the doors. Doors opened quickly. I was given money for the tickets and people gave me everything I needed. I knew that Jesus had a plan for me, said Samantha. Soon Samantha was in the heart of the Amazon training with Salva Vidas, a supportive Adventist mission organization that teaches volunteers to work in the jungles. There, or three months later, the project coordinator told Samantha, I have a place for you in a small village and you'll be the nurse on the Lazaro. Samantha could hardly believe the news. I was so happy, she recalls. Here I can use my nursing skills all the time. The people are very simple with simple problems and I can help them. This is exactly what I want to do to educate people who don't have any knowledge about health. As a Lazaro nurse, Samantha now works with ADRA as, and, it, it, and is based in a village where she operates small a small clinic. Every week she goes to the Lazaro 26 XXVI, providing the only health care available to thousands of people along the Amazon. Whether on the Lazaro or in the village clinic, Samantha often faces emergencies where she knows only God can help. Early one evening, a man arrived at the clinic holding a, his hand in bloodied bandages. What happened, Samantha asked. I was using a grinder and my hand got caught in the blades, he answered. Samantha as her, and her assistant, Gloria, carefully cleaned the hand, applied antibiotics ointment, and rewrapped it tightly in clean bandages. As they prayed with the man, they knew that he needed higher level of care than they were able to provide and asked God for help. A few minutes later, a mother, father, and 10-year-old boy showed up in front of the clinic. The boy had been bitten on the foot by a suracuku, a venomous pit viper, one of the most poisonous snakes of the Amazon. How long ago was he bitten, Samantha asked. About five hours ago came the reply. Samantha was shocked. According to all medical lit literature, the boy should have been dead long before now. Quickly she provided emergency care, doing all she could to stop and spread the spread of the poison. Samantha knew that it was only through a miracle that the boy was still alive, and to survive he would continue to need he divine help. She, always, she also knew that both boy and man needed to be taken to the nearest hospital, an eight-hour trip by regular boat or two hours by address fast boat, the Jesse Hallowell. While a fast boat was clearly the best option, it also took the most fuel and would completely deplete the clinic's reserve for the month. The fuel reserve had been saved for emergencies that might arise from a visiting group who had come to make improvements to the clinic and village. Knowing that two lives were in jeopardy, Herbert Kalbermatter, the ADRA Brazil director for the Amazon region, approached the group and explained the situation. Immediately, they told him to use the fuel and that they would trust in God for protection. It was dark and rainy by the time Samantha, her two patients, and the boy's mother climbed into the Jesse Hallowell for, fast, for the fast two-hour ride to the nearest hospital. Pelting down rain mixed with river sprays on the little boat and its precious cargo sped down the river. At last, the little group arrived in Manicapuru, the closest town. The boy was admitted to the local hospital, but the man was taken to the large hospital in Manos. Samantha didn't see the man again, but again, after a week, he was able to visit the boy. She was able to visit the boy in the hospital. When I see the boy now, I think Jesus is awesome. He put his hand on the situation and saved two lives. Life in the village isn't easy, with limited water and electricity, about three hours a day. No phones or internet, and very little contact with the outside world. But Samantha doesn't mind. Just in the time I've been there, been here, I feel my life has changed. I realize now what's really important in life. I understand much more about Jesus, and I believe that he brought me here. That was a good story. I'm glad she told it. And now we'll close with prayer. And we have a Sabbath school class here in the sanctuary. We have one across the hall in the library and one back here in the choir room. 
and you may join any class you choose to. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your abundance of that you give to us more than we possibly ever could need. We see these people, hear these stories about people in the Amazon who have almost nothing, and yet you perform miracles for them much more than you do here because they have such a greater need. We have an overabundance and have no need, as is the saying goes, of your blessings, but we do need you, Lord. We need you at all times to be with us and to guide us, to keep us with wisdom and knowledge so that we can spread that knowledge to other people. And now we ask you to bless our Sabbath school teachers. And it, when we go into our church service, bless our pastor with words to speak that will glorify your name. And we thank you for your presence here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Small detail, I gotta turn myself on. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Let's have prayer before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us a glimpse of what is going on or what has gone on in the past which helps us to better understand what is going on now. And we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to bless us as we continue to delve into the great controversy. We thank you for your goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, as review, this quarter we are looking at rebellion and redemption. And within the Adventist faith, or understanding of the Bible, we have a term that sort of encapsulates or exp that uh, puts a title, if you will, on this, uh, this uh, topic, and we call that what? The Great Controversy, okay? And the Great Controversy is focused on who? Say it a little louder, Kathy, I can't hear you. Christ and Satan, okay? So Satan, we, um, our understanding is, is that Satan had some questions. Is there anything wrong with questions? No. no, there's nothing wrong with questions. But Satan, or Lucifer, as he was known in heaven, decided that he had a better way. And he challenged God, if you will, and stirred up a rebellion in heaven. And last week we focused on the crisis in heaven 
and recognize that the great controversy did not begin here on this earth, but rather it began in heaven. Eventually, in heaven, there was what is referred to in the Bible as war, and Satan was cast out of heaven. And along with him went, we think, about a third of the angels. I have to preface everything that I say here today with the, with the understanding that there is so much we don't know. There is so much that we don't know about really what took place in heaven. Um, you know, we talk about heaven <laughs> as if it's a... Well, we talk about heaven as, as, as if we really know what it is, but it isn't. We really don't know. We don't know how many people are there or how many created beings are there. We don't even have a very good understanding. Well, we have a very limited understanding as to even how God operates, what his modus operandi is. You know, how, how does this all work? But nevertheless, something very earth-shaking well, that's not really the right word, I guess. Heaven shaking <laughs> took place in heaven that had huge ramifications in terms of God's government and what he had set up. Now, there's been a, a, a little conversation going on between myself and a couple of people, and uh, the question is, if you read Ellen White, she very clearly articulates the fact that there are other created beings in other worlds, okay? And the question has been raised, uh, is there a way that we can demonstrate that in the Bible? And <laughs> if you want to know something today, where do you go? To the internet. <laughs> That's right, if you Google it. <laughs> <laughs> you Google it and you'll find everything there. <laughs> and it's very interesting what you find on the internet about that, that question because it's a very specific question. You can do searches on that issue. What if you don't have a Googler? <laughs> if you don't have a Googler, well, you can find somebody who's got a Googler. Um, and it's very interesting. There are, there are people who will tell you categorically that the Bible says nothing about any other created beings in anywhere else in the world or in the universe the cosmos, however you want to phrase that. And then there are people on the other, then that uh, there's a spectrum and that goes over to another side which says, well, there does seem to be indications in the Bible that indicate that there could very well be. Uh, there, it's not an absolute, but um, very likely there are other created beings in the universe. And Ellen White, in her writings, very clearly takes the position that there are, in fact, other created beings. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that make sense, that God would have other created beings in other parts of the universe? Sure. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that makes perfect sense. Well, to me, I think if you look at just at the stars at <clears throat> night. Okay, at the stars at night. I mean without any instruction from the Bible or any other information like that. Just look up at the stars at night, take a telescope and look at some of these signs and consider just your intuition is apt to tell you, I don't think we're alone here. Yeah, because I don't think we're alone. there's a huge amount of matter out there. Yeah. yeah, we're talking about billions of galaxies, with billions of stars, and you start adding those numbers up or multiplying those numbers, and, and pretty soon my brain begins to kind of uh, either shrink in on itself or kind of blow up, one of the two, it depends, because... Well, it would really be a small god if he only put out material stuff like that, but right. nobody else there. Exactly. I mean, if we are the only people in the universe, we really worship a small god. Okay, I agree with that. the mass, now, Kathy? Well, I'm also thinking when he says that, if God 
only created us, then he failed. Really. Because of sin. Okay. Sin, <clears throat> he, he allowed Satan to come down here and this became a very sinful world. Yeah, okay. And from our, my growing up with Ellen White sure. and all that, there's worlds out there who have never sinned. Yeah. And they're we believe. looking at us yeah. to make sure that we're even worthy of being a part of their universe. Okay. Do they want to let us in? Now, let me ask you this question just to kind of tie this on uh, down because I don't really want to spend a lot of time focusing on this today. But does it make sense that if, in fact, God has created other worlds who have not fallen, can you understand why God might not have made us very aware of that? Well, I don't think. Uh, knowledge of that kind of thing gains a lot with respect to your salvation. In other words, Our your life is at stake. Yes. And so should I fill your mind with a whole bunch of stuff that can't possibly help you to get there right. to save your life? And so when a person is in a desperate situation, they don't want to know what the last political event has been happening. I mean, the person that's dying and you're trying to tell them, you know what happened with respect to Donald Trump last week? <laughs> I mean, what's that got to do with my life? Right. And therefore, another thing, too, is all of these people, the angels and everything, who sinned knew all about this stuff, yes. and it didn't stop them. It did not stop them. And they are still just as rebellious with all the information right. that we would like to know about, right. but it just points out that that kind of information, a whole bunch of information only floods your mind and can actually hinder you, right. as it's pointed out today when we talk about extraterrestrials. Right. Look at all of the stuff that we talk about in movies right. about what goes on in the universe. Well, there's Chewie. Right. There's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah, let's there's, not get to <laughs> I mean, there's right. an endless. Right. The, the fact is it doesn't help us in any way, shape, or form. In fact, it distracts. If we knew that there was a planet out there 100 million light years away, what would everybody be doing? We'd be trying to get there. Okay, and we're trying to now go to even Mars, I understand, and there's nothing there. So, yes, one last thing. Uh, I read Ellen White says that our subject that we should talk to people about yes. is Jesus and heaven. So, we, heaven is up there, and yes. we should know about heaven. So, I okay. think heaven is a very important thing to know about, yep. and, and especially Jesus and salvation. And we've been provided some information about heaven and about the plan of salvation, and that's for our benefit. That's to help us escape where we're at. Okay, so this week, the crisis in Eden. Last week, crisis in heaven. Now, crisis in Eden. When God created this world, what kind of a world did he create? A perfect world. A perfect world. He's, in the Bible, it refers to it as what? It was all? Very good. Very good. Yeah, it was good. It, it, everything fit together and worked perfectly. And he put in charge of this world who? Adam and his helpmate, Eve. Exactly. Okay. Now, again, here's where we move into things that we don't know a whole lot about. One of the things that we believe was part of Satan's issue was the plan that God put into place that became us, this world. Okay, the creation of this world. Satan wanted to be a part of that process. And God apparently said, no, that's not appropriate for you. You don't have the ability to create out of nothing. Satan gets cast out of heaven and sometime in this timeline, and again, I don't know the timeline, God does create this world. Adam and Eve are created. And there is this need to get up to speed. What does that mean to you, to get up to speed? To understand, to catch up. Yeah. I mean, Adam and Eve, when they were created, and again, I don't know exactly what all... God put into their brains. 
I have to assume that he gave them a language when he created them. So they, I think they had the ability to speak. Um, they had the ability to, as adults, I would think, be able to process information, make value judgments, but they had to learn some things. They, I don't think they came with preloaded in their brains the history of the cosmos. They had to learn that. From whom did they learn that? Jesus. 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 And? I, I'm, I'm going to say angels too. Yes, okay. Uh, oh, oh, pardon? Pardon? God. Okay, God, yes. Oh, God, God, Jesus, no, okay. I mean, But we understand that who was involved, who was responsible for the creation of the world? Jesus, Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. We understand that Jesus Christ, we, that, that we take that from John, Jesus Christ was the one who was responsible for the creation of the world. Okay? God said, let's create man in our image, so I think they had a, I don't know, to me it just... I, I think you should stop right there. I don't know. <laughs> because we don't know exactly to what that all necessarily means. But Jesus Christ was involved. But who else was involved? And I think this is important because if you, again, this comes from Ellen White, and I, I don't apologize for using her as a, as a resource. She makes this statement. She says, holy angels gave instruction to Adam and Eve concerning their employment, what they were supposed to do. I mean, Adam and Eve, you can imagine them. They're waking up. They've been created. It's Friday. Friday night, Sabbath, Sunday starts. What are we supposed to do around here? Okay, so somebody shows up. An angel shows up and says, okay, this is how you run the world. These are the things you're responsible for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also, let's continue. <clears throat> and also taught them concerning the rebellion of Satan and his fall. In another place, she talks, she uses this, she talks about angels, and she talks about conversed daily with holy angels. Okay, so what does that tell you about the kind of God we're, that we're dealing with in relationship to the creation of his created universe? What does it tell you? I think the true love story is when the, it's not the heaven story. Okay, yeah, okay. But what does, this tell, what, does the, what does this tell you, the angel issue, tell you about the kind of God we serve? He cares, he is daily engaged with us. He is there to help us understand what is going on and what was the number one issue in the universe at this point in time? The rebellion. The rebellion of Satan, okay? Satan was out and about in, in whatever capacity, and again, I have no idea how that really operated, but he was out and about, and he was out stirring up trouble. Yes? I think that when Adam and Eve um, was created on Friday, I think that God spent time with Adam and Eve saying, look what I have given you, look what's around. You're talking about how beautiful Eden was. And then, so he created the earth in six days. You have a good imagination. And then the seventh day, he rested. Okay. Eight o'clock, the bell rang, Adam and Eve, sit in your chairs, and we're going to have lecture today. Is that you think what happened? I don't believe it happened like that. <laughs> How much time happened between the creation of, of Adam and Eve and the fall of Adam and Eve? We don't, know. we don't know. You read the Bible, it's almost as if they're created on, on Friday, they have the first Sabbath, and that next week, boom, they, it's all over with. Uh, we don't know how much, much time. Yeah? Just a little lower. You don't have to go to the spirit of prophecy for that. Okay, but when God brought the animals to him, there was no Eve yet. So he had spoken to Adam, and from what I understand, he gave him first gospel glory. And Adam knew what was going to happen. 
God knew what was going to happen. When you say knew that was going to happen, what are you referring to? What has happened? Lucifer. Lucifer was loose in the universe. Well, again, let, let, let's, let's not try to, to shrink everything into a three-hour period of time. No. I, I think we're talking about, I mean, it talks about the angels interacting with Adam and Eve daily. So to me, it was more than there was a period of time when Adam was by himself with God before Eve was created because all the animals had a mate. And he looked around and he thought, I have no mate. And God says, he needs a help. Then he created Eve. Okay. That's what I understand. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that everything happened that Adam was responsible for in that short period of time. I mean, I think all kinds of things. Again, this is a very succinct little description of uh, events that I believe are actually a fairly long time. Now, so let's not get detracted on that, though. However, <clears throat> who wanted access to Adam and Eve? Why? Why? Well, that's a good question. Exactly. What does he gain by getting us onto his side? What? He wanted to be the boss, and he still wants to be the boss. Okay, but but where was Adam? Oh, excuse me. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Where was Lucifer at this point in time? I mean, again. Oh, well, wait, 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 wait. I'm. I got to tell you right now. I don't know anything. <laughs> okay. Or to me, as an intelligent person, he has to sort of approach the problem like this. Just like a criminal who has done something wrong, he gains an advantage if he can get some hostages. The reason is because he can use them either as a shield or as a bargaining chip. And therefore, he's going to look around on the universe and try to figure out where is the best place that I can get this. And when you think about it, those inexperienced people that were just created is the most likely place. Yeah. And so to me, that's the way an intelligent person would try to approach the problem. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me step back again here. And I want to just say this again. There's a lot we don't know, yes. okay? Because this is one of the things that you, that you have to recognize, is you have this place called heaven, which is where God and the angels apparently operate. We also believe, we think, that there's biblical evidence that there are other created worlds. If you read the Bible story, though, Satan, when he's, he is cast out of heaven, and it, and it, it almost appears as if what has happened in heaven, nobody else really knows about. Or if they do, they don't really understand the issues. If you, if you try to, if you look at what happens on this earth and say, okay, what happens on this earth is in fact similar to what happens at the other places where God has created, Satan wants to, as, as Duane has said, he wants to establish a place of government for himself to demonstrate that his, his way is a better way. He's, done a good job. He's been cast out of heaven in, in some way. And, and, and please don't try to push me here as to whether or not this happened before the creation, after the creation, or later on in the history of this earth, because I don't really know, okay? But the bottom line is, is that God, in terms of this earth, sets up a way for Satan to have access to Adam and Eve, but at the same time to limit his access. Now, where did that come from? Was that an arbitrary decision on the part of God? <clears throat> Again, I will simply tell you, this is the Gensler theology here, but I believe that there were rules of engagement that were set up where did those come from? Were they simply decided by God arbitrarily? Were they simply decided between God and Satan? 
Or were there other people involved? And I use the word other people. I'm talking about created beings. You know, it's interesting. If you look in the book of Revelation, you have a judgment scene in which God and thrones are set up. And who is appeared? There are 24 what? Elders. Elders. Who are they? Who are they? They represent other worlds. What you think. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> but the reality is, is that they may in fact be the referees who are making sure that the rules of engagement are in fact followed by both God and Satan. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> if you read the Bible, if we understand that there's more to this cosmos than heaven and us, there is a universe out there that is making or has made or is making decisions as to who is right and who is wrong. But we don't know. We don't know. But we're trying to make sense out of what is going on. <laughs> Burns, Oregon. Okay, welcome. Yeah. And so, just by saying that God and Satan were refereed by rules of engagement, that depresses me. God is omnipotent. He is. He is the the king. He reigns over everything. He has dominion. I give him glory. I worship him. I don't look to a referee to tell me that God's out of line. No, no, no. God is in charge. That's the way I look at it. I'm sorry. I just unloaded on you guys. No, no, that's good. That's good. We're glad you're here. <laughs> okay, well, good. But the whole reason for this is to let the whole world know that God is in charge and that Satan was wrong in what he did. And that's the great controversy to be judged by everyone. Okay, so let's come to this earth, Garden of Eden. God creates this world. What does he put in the Garden of Eden? A tree of knowledge. Two trees. Two trees. Okay. What are they called? Knowledge, knowledge of good, good and evil, evil and, and, and everlasting life. And the tree of life. Okay. Where did that come from? What do you mean where did it come from? From God. Why two trees? Why two trees? Why two trees? It came from God. Why? So, I want that beauty to stay in my heart. Okay. Welcome to so, the real world. <laughs> so let, let, me, let me just respond here that, and say this. I am not in any way, shape, or form wanting to create doubt. Rather, I am trying to help us actually become stronger in what we understand so that it makes sense to us. Because, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Sure. I was just going to address your question. Oh, okay. Why two trees? 
Why true trees? Okay, thank you. In our image. And in my mind, I think, well, what is the essence of God? Who is God? Okay. The Bible is pretty clear. Right. John put it most succinctly. God is love. Okay. Right. right. So if he's going to make man in his image, that means man has to love. Okay. Which means man has to have a choice. Have a choice. Okay. And the choice comes down to who? The two trees are a gift. Man, you're free. Okay. But, but, but behind the, the choice, the, the tree, the trees, the trees represent something other than just two trees. Well, I think the tree of knowledge of good and evil gives Satan a platform to spout his views. Okay. What God is doing is he's dealing with a person who has challenged him. Mm -hmm. And instead of killing him immediately, right. if he were to do that, when you have people of free choice who have affection for somebody, there's a lot of people in the universe who had affection for Satan. Right. If you kill him without them understanding why you're doing that, What's going to happen is you're going to get more rebellion, and you're going to have to kill more people. How many are you willing to kill? And so your approach to the problem has to be, I'm dealing with people with free choice. They can choose to get on his side. And they're not even clear as to what he's standing for because he is not going around saying something like this. God is a bad person right. and so forth. Uh -huh. What he's doing is just like every person who is a rebel, he makes an appeal from the standpoint uh -huh. for you. Right. I am trying to bring something good to the community <clears throat> and the government is trying to stop me, just like they're trying to do over there in okay. Burns. And right. so what God is doing is he's allowing a platform Allowing yeah. Satan to present his ideas, but at the same time to protect you, he says, don't go listen to them. There is nothing to be gained by going to listen to him. Okay. But you have a choice. If you want to go listen to him, you can. And to me, that is what freedom is all about. But you must remember that with freedom comes responsibility. If you choose to do something, you must take the results of what you choose. Okay. You will not be allowed to put it onto somebody else. Okay. The whole issue with of two trees is free will. The the uh, as he pointed out, God intends that when the, when the rebellion happened in heaven, all right, he took a third of the angels with him. But you can bet your bottom dollar that he talked to all of them. They all heard him. Yep. Yep. And you <clears throat> Okay. One is for and one is against. One is self and one is, is other. Do you, do you wish that God had not put a tree of knowledge of good and evil on this earth? No. Yes, I do. The, the two <laughs> trees to me is one is eternal death and the other means eternal life. So you either choose one or the other. Okay. Okay. Again. Free will. So here's a question that I can ask, but I don't know the answer to. But I'll just put it out here in the question. 
If there had not been a Lucifer, if there had not been a rebellion in in heaven, if there had not been a war in heaven in which Lucifer was cast out of heaven and God had created this world, do you think he would have put a tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden? No. He would not have needed to. Okay, why did he need to? Because there needed to be a matter of free choice, free will. No, okay, yes, I'll I'll grant you that. But basically, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and you've already said this, and I'm just going to rephrase it, identified one point, one location in this earth where Satan could state his case against God in relationship to those who inhabited this earth. That was the one place. Yeah, to me, is that is, good news or bad news? This is a fair news? way for a government to deal with a person who is anti-government. Exactly. Is that, is that good news? Yes. Yeah. That, that, that God did that. Well, okay. It tells you that God is not a tyrant. It, it tells, tells you that God you. is not a tyrant. It also tells you something else about God. God wants you to be an in, intelligent person evaluating a situation and coming to a conclusion. Okay. He is not afraid to be accused by an enemy. He is willing to let that individual state their case. Now, do you have to hear their case? No. Do you have to go and listen to them? No. (laughs) Exactly not. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what God did and the angels did is they, they talked to Adam and Eve and they said, listen, this is what's going on. This is what has happened. This is what is being said about God. They opened up to them what Satan was all about. Yes? It makes a lot of sense, but I guess what uh, popped up in my mind is as a parent, (laughs) am I willing to let every evil person state their case to my children? People who want to Yeah, and and again, all I can say, those are good questions, all I can say is is that God in his wisdom knew what was best and and did not leave Adam and Eve defenseless. They They were not toddlers, they were adults who apparently had the ability to understand big issues. Yes. And, and, and I really think that he's telling us, like he told Job, just hang on. Yeah. It looks bad, but this is going to be good. He's in it to win it. He, I think there's a time coming when we'll all say, wow. <coughs> it, it, you know, he had it under control the whole time, yeah. and there's the, the outcome. Our understanding, and I believe this is true, I believe that there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil that was placed on every created world in the universe. And wherever there were created beings, Satan had the opportunity to make his case. And we understand, again, this is coming from Spirit of Prophecy, that in fact they said, thanks, but no no thanks. We understand the issues, we're willing to to trust in God and, it, and, and we're going to stay loyal to him. And it came down to basically one planet and that was this. And again, we do not know the timeline in terms of how long they had to, to be with God and understand the big issues, but they made a choice. Now it's interesting, oh, I'm sorry. What really hits me and really cements it with me is that one verse of the Bible says that God cannot lie. And to me, I, I look at that and I say, that's great. 
because Satan, he can do everything he wants to. Right? Yeah. He can lie, cheat, he can sure. deceive everything. God but limits himself. Yeah, God, God limits himself in a big way in terms of this thing. Exactly. Well, I think we have to remember, though, from Satan's perspective, what he says is that God lies. And God so says God is telling us he doesn't lie. Right. But Satan is saying that's not true. Right. God is a liar. And that's exactly what Satan came to when he, when he actually interacted with Eve. What, did, what, did, what, did Satan, what was the crux of what Satan said to Eve? God didn't tell you the truth. Yeah. He's a liar. You're, he's a liar. That tree will give you wisdom. This tree is going to make you what? Like God. Were they already like God? They had been created in God's likeness. Another interesting <clears throat> thing about other people on other planets, how do they know what goes on down here? Is how do they? Oh, is my. Is there some giant <laughs> video screen in yes. which they observe what happens down here? I mean, if it was, I would never want to look at it if I was in a place of peace. Yeah. But anyway, how do they know? I mean, the spirit of prophecy constantly tells us they are aware of everything that's going on down here. They witnessed Jesus dying on the cross. How did they see that? How did they see that? I yeah. mean, we're talking about people trillions of miles into outer space. Yeah, I know. And so these are a whole bunch of unanswered questions, but the spirit of prophecy is very clear that they are aware of everything that goes on down here. and are observant and evaluated and so forth. Okay. This, but where is that in the Bible? Planet. Pardon? But where is that in the Bible? That's just it. It's not in the Bible. It, 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 you're not going to find that concept in the Bible. That is a concept that you will find in Ellen White. Okay. No, no questions about that. Okay. Well, I think it's when we say that, what we're saying is in explicit terms. In, in explicit terms. You Thank can you. deduce it from yes. the Bible, yes. but not in explicit terms like Ellen G. White. And that's exactly what I was talking about earlier in some of the conversations with some of your others. I mean, there, we're, it talks about witnesses watching what's going on. I, you know, what does that really mean? I don't know, but it, I think it's important. Now, I, I'm sorry. Okay, we've got to wrap up here. Yep. Well, he did. He had the freedom of choice too, but he nobody was tested more than Job. Yep. But yet he comes through it with the freedom of choice. He picked the right way. I think another important uh, issue. This. I think in. Go ahead. Let her talk. Okay, I I, I want to just change the subject a little bit slightly here because what happened at the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Bad choice. They made a bad choice. That's exactly right. It was a bad choice that had massive yeah. consequences. Massive consequences. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can look in my life and I can see where I've made some stupid mistakes that have had, that I've had to pay some painful things for. But nothing like this. I mean, talk about big time mess up. And who shows up? Satan. Who shows up? Winged serpent. No, no, we passed that. Shows who shows up? Jesus God shows up. Jesus shows up. <laughs> Jesus shows up. Okay, he's been called a liar. And they bought into it. They accepted the lie. And Jesus now shows up. Yes, sir. The last two paragraphs in the Bible, okay? I think it says that whoever steers the faithful and takes from the book will be taken out of the tree of the book of life. Okay. Which that means there's a register of who's, in the, who's accepted the tree of life. Okay, right. All right. Um, so if you look here in Genesis 3, Starting with verse 8, this is after the fall. The, 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 everything has taken place now. Satan has, has, has won his argument. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. And man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? 
Okay, where are you? And what was Adam's response? I heard your voice. I heard your voice, and I was afraid. Because he knew he had done something wrong. <laughs> because, go ahead. Because I was naked. Yeah. And, and what did he understand that was the result of? God understood that the only way you could know that, that's why he asked, so who told you? And he says, the only way you could actually know that is because the fact that you, have now, you are now aware. And why did God ask that question? Did God need to be informed of that? No. 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 Why did he He's, ask that question? And his trust in the honesty of Adam. Have you ever had those, have you ever had that conversation? Has anybody ever had that conversation with you sure. as a child? <laughs> I mean, I can remember some situations in which I was caught red-handed. You bet. And my parents would have oftentimes had a conversation with me. So, son, tell me, <laughs> how did this happen? Well, <laughs> my brother. My sister, or whatever else. Why, why did you do that? Okay. <clears throat> what was God doing here? What if you don't have an excuse? We make it up. We make up excuses. What was God doing here? He wanted to see whether or not they would admit to their choices. Whether or not they would acknowledge, claim ownership of the decisions they had made. Why was that important? Because that's the first rule of freedom. You must take responsibility for the choices that you make. Okay. That is the first rule of freedom. Okay. There is no freedom without that. Exactly. The question was whether it was freedom or license. And that had to be established. In other words, it, it, it had to be established that this was not a whim, that this was a choice they made. It was a cho and, it, and it was a choice that they understood that they, that they were making as they made the choice. Exactly right. By the way, by the way, did Eve, as she stood at the tree, engage in conversation with this serpent, know that she was in the wrong place? Yes, she did. Did Adam know when he took the apple, or fruit, whatever it was, and ate, did he know yeah. that he was making a wrong decision? Yeah. Yes. Yes. They both, intellectually, understood that they were making a decision that was diametrically opposite of what God had told them to do. Kathy. How, how aware at the end of Adam and Eve's life, and this is just a speculation, do you think they were totally aware of the decision they made? I mean, they must have been absolutely I don't even know the right word for it, to know that what they had done was the cause of even their own son committing murder. I mean, the, the, that they were responsible. The responsibility on their hearts and their, on them to know that, and they have no idea what's going on. And since that time, what's it going to be like when they're resurrected and they see what they did? Well, it'll at least be all over, and uh, all of the good that came out of it will be pointed out I and mean, so forth. I mean, so let me ask you a question. Do you think their, oh man, I mean, I, I guess this is a value statement. I'm not sure how to make this, but I mean, we as individuals have the same experience. I mean, we can, I mean, I can certainly look at my life and, and see where things didn't. Yeah, but they were the first. Well, okay, they were the first. They were okay. The first. Yes, sir. But didn't God give Adam a choice to replace her? So that was where the first day were divorced. He chose to keep her. Well, I don't know that God gave him a choice. Yes, he said he would destroy her. No, 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 no. I don't think you'll find that in the Bible. No. And I don't think you'll find that in the spirit of prophecy either. But Adam could have trusted God to sort this issue out. He did not do that. He had a better idea. And that's where the human race gets in trouble again and again and that's again. That's where the choice of divorce came in at that point. It's been all lost. Uh, I don't think that was God's idea. I think that no, was... I didn't um, say it was God's oh, okay. Idea. Effect yes. That. Yes. The, uh, the, the end result, of course, of Adam and Eve were, is, has been terrible. And, and there will be a time when Adam and Eve Herself 
Yes? Whether it was self-deception right. or whether the, the, she believed the lie that the, that the devil told her is moot. The point is she was deceived. She was tricked into making a decision that she knew was wrong. Okay. Okay. Adam was not. Adam was not tricked and he was not deceived. Women have been tricking men for millenniums since. <laughs> Created a liability. Adam was not deceived in this matter. He knew what she had done. Yeah. And he overtly chose her lie. Yeah. So it's the, the situation is a little different yeah. between Adam and, and Eve. They're still responsible. They still, I'm sure, for a lot of sorrow. Okay. So we've gone through this scenario, and, and I hope it hasn't been too convoluted, but at the end of the day, what was God's response to this problem? Sacrifice of himself. I have a plan. He came and he said, I have a plan, and that plan involves what? I am going to take your place. I am going to suffer the consequences of what you have made a decision on. And you can be restored to what you have been lost, what you have lost because of your decision. I am going to step in and provide a plan of salvation. That to me is, is the most amazing response that one can come up with. That here is a God who has been rebelled against, if you will, and yet he has stepped in and provided us with a way of being saved. Another thing that's very important with respect to the great controversy, the way we're teaching it, is because we have competition today. We have competition today, the yes. competition is in the theater, in movies like Star Wars and Star Trek, which is teaching a different philosophy yes. about what goes on in the universe, and our government is spending a huge amount of money trying to find other planets in the universe, the Goldilocks zone, as they call it, where there are other people and we can make contact, but their concept of these other people are they are either half animal, they have evolved, death has always been a part of the universe, and so forth. What the great controversy is teaching you is about what the universe is about, and where evil comes from, and that there is no permanent death, right. and so forth, and therefore our children growing up are watching these movies and their minds are being filled with a different philosophy than we are teaching. And not only that, in the video and in the movies, it is so effective to actually see people operating. We sit here and talk. A young child can watch a movie and see people actually operating and interacting. And therefore, that impact on our upcoming generation is going to be huge. And that's why we talked last week, and I'll just refresh it and remind again, worldview, explaining what is going on is so important. At the end here, I want us to close with our, with our, our memory verse or the memory text. It says, Jesus speaking, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent, the Satan, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. At that point, Jesus was basically saying to Satan, you may have won this battle, but you have not won the war. I will win the war. And it's within that context that we, who are caught up in this great controversy, can indeed have hope because God is the winner of the war. Let's stand and let's have prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that you have been willing to take the risk to create us as free moral agents. I ask that you would forgive us for when we have failed to represent you correctly, to live in harmony with the way you have designed us to live, and I ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to recreate within us the people you want us to be. 
May we represent you well this coming week. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good Sabbath.